into my dungeon. Welcome to Cauldron's Crypt. I'm your host, Master Cauldron. If you're new to the show, I use my 23 years of experience to dispel myths, get rid of stereotypes, and answer your questions about BDSM. You can call in at 865-268-4005 to leave your questions or visit the crypt at cauldronscrypt.com. On this episode of The Crypt, I'm going to hit those rules to love by and then talk about a few things recommended by Forsaken Nymph, which are relationship burnout, mind reading, and managing expectations in BDSM relationships. After that, it's a listener question from Draven Dahman that ended in me writing 10 rules for hard conversations. Rules to love by. Rule number one, safe, sane, consensual, and informed. Rule number two, kinky. That's K-N-K-I from the Kinky app available on all platforms. Not a sponsor. That stands for knowledge, no intolerance, kindness, and integrity. And rule number three, the quote from Mr. Paul Young. Submission is not about authority and it's not about obedience. It is all about relationships of love and respect. All right, here is the message from Forsaken Nymph, a listener and friend. It reads, I just now got to listen to the last episode. It was good, as always. My condolences to losing fun size. Thank you for that forsaken nymph. During the show, someone chatted a line about complacency. That made me think about an idea for the next show. You touched on introducing kink, the honeymoon phase. How do you keep things interesting and spice things up after you have gone through every page of your kinky Kama Sutra? What is the importance of continued open communication after you have gotten to know your partner? What are the dangers of mind reading or expecting someone to know what you want because you have been together a while? Just an idea. Wink and smiley face. Well, back at you, Forsaken Nymph, and thank you so much for sending that in. So let's break these down question by question, and I will tell you what I think. How do you keep things interesting or spice things up after you've gone through every page of your kinky Kama Sutra? Well, after a lot of thought about this, it is a difficult thing to do from time to time, as one of the worst parts of a new relationship of any sort is that things do start to become complacent. So I've got five things here. The first one, hang out with other kinksters. We often become energized in groups of people, and if your only play is around other people, at least you're still having play, and after a period of time, that can always be brought up. Uh, Think about the past three months. We've been to parties every other weekend, and that was the the only times that we've played, or we've been once a month, and that was the only time that we've played. So hopefully through that, it will kind of help keep that fire going. We have a club here in Knoxville called Sanctuary that happens once a month, but I like the name of it because that is what it is to me. It is a sanctuary. Uh, A lot of people think church, especially in the South, when they hear that word, and that is what it does for me. It is a place for me to go and and become filled or re-energized in ways that I really need. Uh, Number two. Attending play spaces or new play spaces. There again, complacency. I mentioned Sanctuary. In Nashville, there is The Mark. In Atlanta, there's 1763. Those are the other two clubs that are closest to me. Nashville, you're looking about three hours to Nashville and then three and a half, maybe four, depending on traffic, down to Atlanta. But visiting different clubs and getting to know different people in different play spaces and seeing other people play, people that don't play like you did, like the group that you started in, is very important for you to broaden your horizons, not only just from an educational sense, but also with what Forsaken Nymph is asking about, uh, bringing that chemistry back. You learn something new, you want to try it out, and you want to try it out often until You either feel that you've perfected it and it just becomes part of your regular repertoire or until you've used it so much that it becomes boring. When one thing becomes boring, if we keep going, we will often find that something else that we're already doing kind of comes back into style with us. So then we'll pick that back up and play with that for a while. But when you've been doing this for as long as I have, even people a year or two years in, you can find yourself becoming bored with all that you know. So never stopping that educational process is very important. Uh, Number three, 
explore your soft limits. That's an interesting one to do. Again, these are the soft limits. So these are things that at some point in your relationship, you have said, you know, under the right circumstances, or maybe down the road, we can revisit this. When you notice these things happening, that might be the time to say, hmm, you know that one thing that I said maybe later down the road? Yeah, let's try playing with that a little bit. Don't allow yourself to get into frenzy because that is really one of those things that can amp up frenzy. But if you tread cautiously, then you can really get into it and it can start to reignite that fire a little bit. Number five is coming straight off of the soft limits and right into readdressing hard limits. If some of your soft limits are changing, maybe some of your hard limits are going to become soft limits. So use the time when your relationship is in a bit of a lull to call for a check-in and go to cauldronscrypt.com slash survey. There'll be a link in the show notes. This is going to be under 202. So cauldronscrypt.com slash 202. And you can find all the links to everything that I'm going to talk about right there. But it's a great way to kind of get yourself through this check-in to go over these limits. Redo the survey and print that out and tell your partner that you've done this and that you would like for them to do it as well. Because almost everybody, when they retake this thing, and it happens a lot, and that's fine. It's free and it does not put you on my mailing list. So take it as many times as you'd like. But when you come together and you start looking at these things again, you're going to find things have changed. And that's the way it should work. So don't let that surprise you. Embrace the change. So how do you keep things interesting or spice things up after you've gone through every page of your kinky Kama Sutra? Just five quick things that I could come up with. Number one, hang out with other kinksters. Number two, attending play spaces or new play spaces. Number three, explore soft limits. And number four, readdress hard limits. I think I said that there was five. There's only four. So there are the four things. Next question. What is the importance of continued open communication after you've gotten to know your partner? The most important thing people can do. That's the importance. It is still the most important thing that you can do. You never really know a person. There's an old saying that someone told me. Well, I don't know if it's an old saying or just something that somebody told me once, but you never truly know somebody until you lived with them. And even then people turn out to be serial killers. So the learning somebody should never stop. Uh, We are creatures that evolve. It's funny because we become so stagnant, yet we're forever changing. So communication is important. I mean, if you're talking about getting to know somebody, which is what your question says, that's not the only purpose of open communication. I mean, that's it's a loaded question when you think about it, because you're also talking about these check-ins. You're talking about people that you meet, maybe possible interest in playing with other people, your vanilla day. How did that go? So many things. The importance of continued open communication never ever stops. And I'm pretty sure that Forsaken Nymph, you asked me that just as a way to get me to give that answer. So there you go, because I know you fairly well. Um, Most people start to think that they know someone when the new relationship energy, the NRE, starts to fade. But this is not at all the truth. That just means that your chemicals are starting to readjust, which is typically six months after the start of a new relationship, sometimes up to a year. Uh, It depends on each person. It depends on the relationship. So it's always different to some degree, at least. But a lot of people think that, well, you know, all this new relationship is over. Our new relationship energy is is over. They mistake that for getting to know someone. And that's simply not the case. It's really then that you truly start getting to know somebody because then you're not under the influence of a chemical. Even though it's a chemical that you're producing, you're still under the influence of another substance or of a substance during that new relationship energy. It usually takes 
about two years, two to three years in a relationship for people to actually really confidently feel that they know someone is what studies have shown. And I know in my own personal relationships, prior to my wife, most of my relationships only lasted a couple of years. Um, I guess the shortest real relationship that I had was a year and a half, and the longest was about two and a half years. And that was because as the new relationship energy wore off and we started to get to know each other, um, I can be a very picky person. (laughs) So either I became difficult to be with or they did. So, um, yeah, that communication needs to never, never stop. All right, before I beat that dead horse too much, let me move to the next one. What are dangers of mind reading or expecting someone to know what you want because you have been together a while? That is a very intense question. I'm going to read that one again. What are the dangers of mind reading or expecting someone to know what you want because you have been together for a while? These two things fall right in line with saying strive to understand before being understood. It's one of my favorite quotes when it comes to interpersonal relationships with anyone. It's a big part of conflict resolution, which is something that was included professionally in my job while working in the psychiatric field. You run into a lot of need for conflict resolution. So strive to understand before being understood. If you practice that, then you will not mind read. Also, for most people, they're the two biggest pitfalls of effective communication. So I'm going to break them up into the two separate categories of mind reading and managing expectations. So we'll take mind reading first. As humans... It's probably one of the most arrogant and stupid things that we do. Besides that, when we think that we know what someone else is thinking or feeling, we are taking away their freedom to think and feel the way that they typically would. Now, when you do this, this is because you place pressure on them to think, feel, and be just like you. And if you wanted to be in a relationship with someone just like you, then you'd be single. You'd be in a relationship with yourself. It's like the only people that we want to be in that relationship with is ourselves. When you catch yourself thinking you already know what your partner or anyone else is thinking or what they feel, that is when you need to communicate the most. So anytime that you get in that situation, that should set off a red flag that tells you to stop everything. Make sure that you are really on the same page. Think about it. If you're right, then you have immediate confirmation that you know them like you think you do. (laughs) If you're wrong, well, chances are it's going to lead to a bonding conversation. Either way, you're showing them respect by asking and not telling them how they think and feel. Thus, this is going to strengthen your relationship. We want to take communication and relationship shortcuts, but humans are way, way, way too complex for that. And we're not built to take those shortcuts. We need to be heard and we need to be understood. So when you realize that you're doing this to somebody else, put yourself in their position. How would you feel if they were doing that to you? And hopefully that's enough to make you stop. To be honest, usually it's not. Because typically, 90% of the world is waiting to speak, while only 10% of people are born as listeners. So the chances are that the person that you're in a relationship with is not a a natural-born listener, is not someone just like yourself who that is their go-to process. And that's what we're talking about here is that go-to process of listening versus that go-to process of wanting to mansplain, which I know a lot of women that mansplain. I know we're famous for it, but everybody does it. But yes, really, really focus on not mind reading because we don't know. If your relationship is experiencing this frequently, then you might uh, want to save it before 
to use my favorite expression, it blows up in your face because it will lead to that. It's going to lead to more and more fights, more and more aggravation. All right, moving into managing expectations. Now, this can be something from very tricky to very easy. How often do you become upset, angry, or depressed because someone didn't react to something the way that you thought they would? Think about that for a second. Hit pause and think about that. I guarantee you that with somebody that you know, it has happened within the last week. Okay, did you pause and think about it? I was serious about that. Let me give you a few situations here. Maybe they weren't as excited about something as you were, and it bummed you out because you expected them to be over the moon, or you had what seemed like the worst day ever, and they pretty much gave you a pat on the butt and told you to shake it off. You expected them to become enraged with you at the idiot boss that you had to deal with that made it the worst day ever. But they didn't. They're just like, yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, it's a bad day at work. And then you become angry with them. That's a very common case. It's like, well, gee, thanks for understanding. You expected them to react in a certain way. And they didn't do that. So you don't know what to do with that because they broke your expectations. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about, well, I expected somebody not to cheat on me and they did. Yes, that's a breaking of expectations, but it comes down to uh, more intimate, more frequent occurrences of these little things. Okay, so let's go back to this this boss, this bad boss, this worst day ever. How did it make you feel? How did you react? And how did this immediately affect your relationship? Were you disappointed? Were you angry, hurt, confused? Through remembering that people have their own thoughts and feelings separate from you and your thoughts and your feelings, and that their perception of the situation is going to vary from your own, you can manage your expectations of others. And the great thing about it is that's going to allow them the freedom of being themselves and ultimately will save your relationship from a lot of rough times. So there are the three questions. Again, Forsaken Nymph, thank you very much. Do you like the little whip crack? Be sure to contact me and let me know what you think about it before we move on to the next listener questions. Thank you to our executive producers. Jeremiah, Silas, Jess, and Arcane Dagger, and Violet Aurelia. Our senior producers, Matt and Emerald Wolf. Our producers, Kane Sin Heather, That Place, which is a club in Oklahoma City, owned by Mitor. Thank you so much. JK and Roxy Bear. And our junior producers, K2SO, Buffalo Dom 84, Pain Waits, and Master Ferguson and Lesumi. If you'd like to become one of our show producers, just go to the website, cauldronscript.com, and click on the support tab. Second, I'd like to thank bdsmcontracts.org for their donation of their beautiful 25-page soft and hardbound MS and DS contracts. That's bdsmcontracts.org. Use coupon code cauldron20, K-U-L-D-R-I-N-2-0, for a 20% discount off of all purchases. And finally, WhippingStripes.com, my personal maker of all things leather and paracord impact toys. I don't have a coupon code. Their items are too inexpensive with too high quality for them to offer a coupon code. She's not a sponsor. I just absolutely love April at WhippingStripes.com. Okay, the message from Draven Domin, D-R-A-V-E-N-D-O-M-O-N. Draven Domin says, Hello to all who read this. He posted this in the Cauldron's Crypt listener FetLife group. I am in need of some advice. I am new to the lifestyle and would like some insight. My wife and I have recently moved into an open, closed relationship with me on the open end. I have wanted to have that conversation with her for a few months. On Saturday night, I was at my monthly Dungeons & Dragons game, and as I was not driving, I was drinking. When I got home after the game, I ended up in a very emotional conversation with her about her currently non-existent sex drive and that I would like to seek out someone that would be able to fill my need. 
I wish you would have included if the emotional conversation that you had was fighting or tears. That would be helpful in this situation. And I should have asked. He continues on. I also have a desire for a DS relationship. The advice I need is in how to handle the conversation with my wife. She is a very strong A personality, and I don't want to end my marriage. I just don't know how to talk to her about this sober. Would a contract of sorts be something we should look at? Any advice or insight would be very appreciated. Okay, again, I'm going to break this up into a few different categories. Let's start off with the basics. Just quick rundown of my personal thoughts. This sounds simply complex on the outside, but in all reality, this is one of the most common. So it's hopefully somewhat comforting to know that it's not, uh, you're not alone. Thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people go through this. But anyway, it's one of the most common and the most complex situations an existing couple will go through as one or both of them realize a need that BDSM can fulfill. Okay, with that said, I will address the first part of this. What you said about being intoxicated. First, anyone that's listened to the show knows my feelings on that. Any conversation worth having is worth having sober. Understand that while you may think you're more free to speak while intoxicated or under the influence of a substance, you are actually under the control of the consequences that you will have to suffer because you said something the wrong way. You couldn't control your emotions during the conversation and went to a blabbering crying fit or became angry and popped off with things that she didn't deserve, or you'll flat out lie. So many things can go wrong. Thus, the only way to have a productive and effective conversation is to take control of your fears and have the conversation sober. I don't like the expression of man up. One, it sounds really harsh, and I don't mean it harsh at all. I don't mean to be insulting at all, because I know from experience how hard this conversation is. I've had it. However, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to just take control of your fear. And I found that that really that's what man up means. When somebody, any time in my life that someone has said, well, you just need to man up and do it. When you really get down to the root of it, what that really means is take control of your fears. Woman up, take control of your fears and and just have the conversation. You have to force yourself to do it. There aren't any tips or tricks to this that I've ever heard that have really worked. The only thing that has helped me in the past is to set the stage and the rules and go back to them as needed. With that said, writing them down beforehand and scheduling the conversation when all parties are well rested, not hungry, and in a generally decent mood are essential. And I wrote these steps down. I wrote these show notes down before we started because I'm having a conversation with you. And sometimes it may sound like I'm reading things, which right now I'm not. I did not put this part in the show notes, but I'm being open with you. I'm communicating to you right now that a lot of this I'm reading off of what I just wrote, because if I don't, I will go on tangent after tangent after tangent. Those that know me well, Roxy. Bear, one of the Patreon supporters, <laughs> Fun Size, my former co host. Anybody that knows me well knows that I like to go on tangents. So, just as you need to do for this conversation, it's what I do for these show notes. Write them down and follow them to help me stay on point so that I don't go off on useless conversation and not give you the content that you deserve for taking your time to listen to me. And thank you for that. Yes, you right now that is listening. Thank you. All right. So let's get into these steps that I have written here to help. And of course, you can see all these in the show notes at coldrenscript.com slash 202 or in your podcatcher that you're using right now. Step number one, pre-plan using the things that I just mentioned. And in case you forgot that so that you don't have to go back 30 seconds, set the stage and the rules and go back to them as needed. With that said, writing them down beforehand and scheduling the conversation when all parties are well rested, not hungry, and generally in a decent mood. These are all essential things. All right, so that's the first one. Pre-plan using those things. The second one, 
ask the other person or people involved when would be a good time to have a serious conversation. While doing this, ensure them that nothing is wrong, but that you have been thinking about your role in the relationship and that you want to talk about ways that you could be better. Remember, even in this step, it is all about I statements, not you statements. If you say, well, let's talk about our relationship and how you can be better in it. That doesn't come across very nice. If you say, let's talk about our relationship and how I can do my part better. And by doing that in this particular situation with having an open, closed relationship due to her non-existent sex drive, as was said, you might find that some of the things that you are doing is causing her to have a non-existent sex drive. Now, that's not always true. Some people just don't have one, and that's okay, and she needs to know that that's okay. She needs to feel normal. She needs to feel loved and secure. Even though she's a type A personality, as you've stated, she still needs reassurance, not just because she's a woman, but because she's a person and every person needs that. A lot of people think, well, they're a strong person. They don't need that. Or a lot of people think, well, you know, every woman needs reassurance. Oh, no, that's wrong. Every person needs reassurance. That is not something that is based on sexual orientation or gender. But I digress. Let me continue with this. So number three, when it's time to have the conversation, start it with the rules saying something like, I love you and you're the most important person or thing in the world to me. And some of the things that we're going to talk about could hurt the other person. This lets her know that by saying it, some of the things that we're going to talk about could hurt the other person. That is telling the other person that you are opening yourself up to be hurt, to hear what they have to say, but to put them first. And even though it may hurt, you're willing to do what it takes to have this conversation. All right. So to continue on in this statement that I wrote, talk about some of the things that we could talk about could hurt the other person. This is because I'm going to ask you to speak honestly about my role in our relationship in ways I can improve. So to make sure we don't end up saying something that we might regret, and this doesn't turn into a fight, I've got some rules that we can talk about and agree on first. A salesman would want to throw fair enough in there because it kind of forces people to say yes, but I don't recommend trying to manipulate a partner. But it is a good technique. Talk about and agree on first. Fair enough. All right. So rule number one, no fighting. Two, no name calling. Three, no words of disrespect. People think that name calling or cussing is just part of normal everyday life and that you can throw these things around to people and it's okay. No, things that you would normally say jokingly when you're having these conversations, don't forget they won't come out as jokes or they won't be taken as jokes. More importantly, it's not about how you intend it. It's about how the other person perceives it in this situation. All right, number four, if things get heated, we will take a break and sit quietly holding each other or at least holding hands until both are ready to continue. This is a great technique. Now you say, but Cauldron, I'm the kind of person that when I get heated, just leave me alone. Let me go off for a few minutes and I'll come back. Okay, if you're that kind of person, make sure that you're being open about this. If they are that kind of person, then in your own personal set of rules here, you might want to make that part of it, that before things get to the heated point where you need to be alone for a little bit and take a break, we need to promise each other that we're going to do our best to recognize that we're headed that way. And before that happens, we are going to immediately call red on this conversation. We're going to immediately stop the conversation and we're just going to sit here quietly with each other. And usually what will happen is someone will invoke this rule. And then if you're sitting on the couch together, you'll kind of turn to each other and start laughing about it. It's a great way to break the intensity and bring a little levity to it. But that's very important. Now, if it does get to that point to where they have to walk away for a minute, or if you're that kind of person that has to walk away for a minute 
and they tell you to, they're saying, you know what, you're getting there, you're getting too heated, let's back it down, we promise to obey these rules, then listen to them. Strive to understand before being understood. Stop and listen. All right, number five, no interrupting each other. Very difficult for people to do because 90% of the world, like I said before, is waiting for their turn to talk. When emotions are high, you don't want to wait. You're going to interrupt, especially if you think that the other person is wrong in what they're saying. So let them finish their thought and then take the opportunity to speak your piece in an appropriate manner. Number six, this conversation will not end here. In a few days, after we have given it some thought, we will dive back into this. This is an ongoing conversation. This is a check-in, and you have to treat it as such. Number seven, we will not allow ourselves to hurt each other because we love and respect each other. Maybe one of the most important ones, which is why it's at number seven, if you are into numerology, it would either be at spot three or seven. Number eight. We will remember that this is a different way for us to communicate, but we promise to be open, honest, respectful, and give it a try because it could make our relationship even better than it already is. That speaks for itself. Number nine, when this session is over, we will reassure each other that we are loved, cherished, wanted, respected, and desired by the other person. I already touched on that reassurance part before, but this puts it in the rules. Rule number nine. Again, when this session is over, we will reassure each other that we are loved, that we are cherished, that we are wanted, we are respected, and we are desired by the other person. Number 10. We will enjoy a reward together for making it through our talk without breaking any of the first nine rules. Now, it's up to you what rewards you want to use, but that's part of that. Discuss that together and write it down. Reward could be sex, ice cream, or a favorite treat, dinner out, a movie, snuggling in bed and going to sleep, something else that you agree upon, but do it now before you start the talk, because that gives you something to look forward to. Because if you break the rules, you can't have the reward (laughs) and treat it that way. Yeah, and not viciously, just when when the conversation is coming to a close and you're readdressing this. If you're proud at how you handled things, if you went through a rough patch and you're able to pull back out of it, things got heated, but you did what you promised each other that you would do, and have these printed. Type these out or copy and paste them from the show notes or off the website. That's fine. Make them your own. Adjust them how you need them, and then bring them with you to this conversation. All right, so that is the 10 rules. The next question and the last question that was asked by Draven Daman, would a contract be helpful? Yes, 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 absolutely. And this is going to be pretty cool for you. As you start the talk and make it known that you'll be taking notes. So you might want to throw that in there too in the rules is that you will take notes. But when you get your pen and paper, offer the other person or people involved in the conversation pen and paper so that they can take notes as well. You might as well, like I said, add the note taking to the rules. If you do this, you would also add that the notes will be present, talked about, and agreed upon at the start of the next session. Making these sound like formal business meetings does something really cool psychologically. It can often put people into more of a logical mindset and helps them keep a check on their emotional state, especially for people who work, quote unquote, professional jobs. If you're in an office setting, even military settings are good with this. But most people know what it is to be professional at work. I've worked a lot of blue collar factory jobs before in between working in healthcare and even with what I'm doing now as a blue collar job. So 
I still have very much that professional side. And if I go into a conversation with someone, that is the side that I want to use. And one of those tricks for me to ensure that I'm doing that, not becoming overly emotional, if I know that it's something that's going to be heated, is I try my best to get into that logical mindset by treating it like it's a business meeting and just really keeping myself in check. So would a contract be helpful? Yes, absolutely. Now, like I said, there's a really cool side effect to uh, taking these notes. As you have these conversations, you will effectively be writing an agreement that can easily be turned into a contract. The cool thing about doing this is that nearly all of the details have already been worked out and it's been a joint effort. You've taken their notes, you've taken your notes that you've had from these conversations, you've put them together, voila, it's already done. Contracts cannot be just taken lightly or just entered into without any thought or any conversation or any negotiation. So these conversations that you're having a.k.a. your negotiation period, are going to lead to this contract? Very, very good questions. Thank you for Saken Nymph and Draven Daman. Thank you for listening. Uh, yes, I'm talking to you right now that is listening. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Next time on The Crypt, well, I don't have a topic yet. I know it's going to be something that will be published in two weeks. Maybe... You, yes, you listening, maybe you'll send me my next idea like Forsaken Nymph or uh, Driving Dumb and Dead. But in the meantime, go to cauldronscrypt.com for show notes, how to subscribe information, and the link to our FetLife group so you can take part in the conversation over there and be eligible for potential giveaways. And there may be one coming up. It is getting close to Christmas. While you're there, click on the Support Us tab to become a Patreon supporter. Also, one thing that is new that I'm going to ask everyone to help me with, all of you cryptors. There again, yes, you, I'm talking to you. Click the link in the show notes for YouTube or go to YouTube and search for Cauldron and you'll find my channel and subscribe to my channel. You don't have to set the notification bell, but if you want to know when I'm going live, you should. But that will really help me out if you just subscribe. You know, again, you don't have to hit the bell for the notifications, but I greatly appreciate it if you would uh, go to the show notes or, or go straight to YouTube and just type Cauldron into the search and I'll come up and subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to get some elevation in my numbers there on YouTube. So that is going to wrap us up for today. If you've listened all the way to the end, I'm ever so grateful. But one of these days I'll come up with a random word for everyone that listens to the end, but thank you so much. This has been Master Cauldron for cauldronscrypt.com. Unearth the truth. <laughs>